We don't expect to find ourselves facing an emergency, but when something terrible occurs, it's too late to learn the skills that might make a difference. We begin in the Cascade Mountains in Washington on February 23, 1994, the day after a large storm swept through the area. We had an incredible amount of snow, 65 inches in 24 hours, which is three inches taller than I am. There was a great deal of difficulty keeping the area open at all. A lot of the problem was avalanche danger. When you get that much snow, you lose people sometimes. Man, you see all the snow? Tons of snow. On that day, John Caples and his 19-year-old son Andy had come up to Crystal Mountain Ski Resort. Andy had Friday off from classes, and he was just determined to come up and go snowboarding. Better than studying, that's for sure. Even though they only open up the areas that are safe, I really didn't want him up alone. Okay, let's go. So I took the day off from work, and we headed up to the, the slopes. I'm very close with my son, so if Andy wanted to ski and to snowboard, that was my opportunity to have that, that kind of time with him. So, uh, you ready to take it down to lunch? Yeah, I'm hungry. Okay, let's go. I'll follow you. Andy is pretty aggressive all the time. He was on the edge of the run. As we were heading down, we were no more than 40, 50 yards apart. I saw him one moment, and in the next moment, Andy disappeared. When we continued, I didn't have much hope left. The feeling is, how am I going to go on with my life? This is my son and my best friend. You see anything? Go! John Caples had been snowboarding behind his son Andy. When he came around a corner, Andy was gone. Andy? I saw some trees moving, and the snow was still falling off of them. Andy! Andy! I knew that if he was all right, he would answer me. I got this awful feeling in the pit of my stomach that something was very wrong and that I needed to get help. 19-year-old Kim Hoffman happened to be skiing by. My son snowboarded off the... The man said he couldn't find his son. Get ski patrol. Are you sure that he went in here? I figured that it would be really dangerous if he got caught back there because of the amount of powder that we have had. He would be buried. Well, I'm an EMT. Let me stay and help So, you. since I'm an EMT and a firefighter, I told him that I would stay and help him. Stop, stop! Can you go and get ski patrol? And I asked another passing by skier to go and get ski patrol. Maybe down there where the snow is disturbed a little bit. I was getting more and more afraid for Andy, and all I could think of was, uh, we've got to find him soon. Andy! We were up in at least chest-deep snow. Andy! Trying to find a leg or an arm. You see anything? No! It was really nerve-wracking. I remember thinking I didn't want to find someone dead that day. Andy! Come on, hold on. Andy! Andy! Oh, I'm gonna go up a little higher. It seemed like we were getting nowhere fast. We were digging and digging and not finding anything, so I decided that we should go up and work our way down. More than 15 minutes had passed. I was just feeling around with my hands, and I hit something hard. The moment I saw his snowboard, I feared for the worst. I feared that Andy'd been under there so long that he wasn't going to make it. 
We were more panicked now that we actually had found him and knew that he was in there. How can he be alive after all this time? It was like digging out a fossil because we didn't know which direction he was facing. We just kind of had to follow his legs and his body to find his head. The snow was very, very hard to dig. I could only pull handfuls out when I needed to be pulling out shovelfuls. Follow his legs. Hold on, Follow Eddie. his legs. It was so frustrating. I see an arm. Keep following it. I was extremely tired. So much time had passed, and at that point, I didn't have much hope left. Just keep digging. I'll get his board off. Okay. The feeling is, how am I going to go on with my life? This is my son and my best friend. I thought he was about ready to give up because he kept saying, oh my God, I know he's dead, I know he's dead. I said, no, he's not. Just keep digging, you know, and we'll get him out and everything will be okay. Careful around his face. But I figured he had been buried probably about 25 to 30 minutes by the time we got to him with lack of oxygen. After four minutes, the brain starts to shut down. Come on, Andy. Deep in my heart, I honestly thought he was dead. I really did. I love you, Andy. Hang in there. All of a sudden, I heard a noise. My heart started to leap, uh, thinking, maybe he's OK. Maybe he's still alive. And I dug even faster. Come on, Andy. He's still breathing. I could see that he was still just barely clinging to life. And I started talking to him. I said, I'm here, Andy. Uh, you're going to be OK. Uh, just hang in there a little bit longer. Bill Ripplinger was the first member of the volunteer ski patrol to arrive. He was as gray as you can imagine, but he was still breathing. Ski patrol is a code one situation. So I immediately called in with a code one on the radio. Ski patrol paramedic Dick Tallman and EMT Emily Johnston got to the scene a few minutes later. It is always kind of a shock, because you hope to look down and see someone who's pink and moving, and he was none of the above. Emily, we need some oxygen. We need to get a heads up for the helicopter, all right? We were concerned that when he was upside down in the snow, he had vomited into his lungs. That stomach contents, if aspirated into the lungs, will eat away at the lungs and ultimately will lead to death. Okay, go to the Okay. We just had to get him out where we could resuscitate him if he needed it. You're concerned about spinal injury, head injury, but none of that really matters if he's not breathing. You ready to pull on three? Okay. I got his head. One, two, three. Okay, watch the O2. Nice and easy, nice and easy. During all that time, I'm kind of in a bit of a haze. I'm looking around for my gloves, and I was thinking, maybe I'm not going to need these anymore. Let's go again. Okay, nice and easy. As soon as we moved him onto the run, to our disbelief, he actually started talking to us. He's definitely the bluest person I've ever seen talking in my life. We're going to get you out of here, almost out. Can you hear me? If he had not been skiing with his father, no one would have known that he was gone. And he wouldn't have been found until sometime in the summertime when all of the snow had melted. Andy was hospitalized for hypothermia and pneumonia, but has completely recovered from the incident. I was really amazed by the battle that my dad waged to find me and dig me out. And it's a great deal. I felt a lot of love between us. And I was uh, extremely happy that we were seeing each other again. Nineteen years ago, I gave birth to Andrew, and his dad was an important part of that delivery. I kind of feel John gave Andrew a second birthing on the mountain that day. So Andy has two birth mothers, me and his dad. Hi, Kim. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. I feel extremely grateful for an angel that appeared on the scene suddenly when I needed her. 
I think Kim is the real hero in this story. If I had gone in there on my own to try and find Andy, I would not have found him in time. I, I just was glad that I could. It was really rewarding because that was the first life I saved. I was surprised to see how good he looked. He looked a lot better than the day that I saw him. <laughs> My dad is one of those great fathers who never missed a t-ball game or a football game. I think that his actions should just prove to everybody else what an incredible person he is. Every moment I have with my son is bonus time. And I look at him and think, man, I'm glad you're here. I'm really glad you're here. <laughs>